sitting here at the Cable Easel with this program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life and uh, the local scenes of uh, Long Island. Um, we go out and we shoot a scene with a video camera and come back here and project it on the monitor and that's about as close as you can get to being out of doors. Uh, and also more comfortable, I might say. This time, uh, this program is about the Jones Beach Tower which everybody who lives here is familiar with and possibly even people who have come to make a special trip to this absolutely remarkable national park. Uh, it was begun a long time ago and uh, there is a handsome uh, motif to it. It's the tower. And I think that when you see it projected, you'll, you'll um, be interested to hear how it came about, who is responsible for it, and um, general information about it and so uh, this can be a travel log at the same time as it is a painting lesson. Uh, some people come and see me sometimes in Virginia and say that they really like the idea that uh, this camera of Cablevision goes around and picks up these wonderful scenes and there it is. It's called the Water Tower. I don't know if it's got water that is in it or usable but it's known as the Jones Beach Water Tower. Um, a remarkable uh, landmark, uh, seen from the air and from the land for many, many miles around. And here, working on the, uh, working on this particular scene, low horizon line. Uh, that means that there is, uh, the m m more attention is being paid to the upper part of the uh, painting than is to the lower, obviously. And it, that's always been, makes for an interesting composition. And composition is something that I think that we have to that I should stress many times because it's a rather intimidating uh, subject matter. People don't understand composition. But anyway, here I am to try and give you some feeling about it. Because uh, symmetry is okay when there's the sofa and two lamps on either side, uh, you avoid that in painting. Your composition demands something slightly asymmetrical, a little bit off-center. In other words, the tower is not going to be put directly on in the middle of this canvas. It's going to be put slightly to the side, such as the shot that was taken has done. And uh, one, of the, one of the more important things to do is to make sure that any vertical structure is in fact vertical. Because if it isn't vertical, it's going to give you the uncomfortable feeling that possibly that thing is about to fall over immediately. Uh, so that is the time that you actually uh, really make sure that you've got a genuine vertical line. I've got another canvas here, and I'm going to set it down here and make sure that, oh, not too bad, my, free, my freehand uh, vertical line works. Uh, well, it takes, it's because I've been doing this for over, uh, well, almost a century, actually, it feels like sometimes. And here is the center line for that tower. Uh, it's, uh, it is such a, um, such an overwhelming size when you approach it that your, that your painting of it can go clear to the edge. Many times I've said, uh, don't go clear to the edge, but uh, this time you can, in fact, go clear to the edge. The, um, Robert Moses was the, uh, was the genius at the uh, uh, base of the uh, creation of this park. And um, even though he drove everybody crazy and he was uh, the brunt of much criticism over many, many, many years, uh, it is because of him that uh, this park exists and it's because of him that it looks the way it does and it's his, um, he, was really, he was really a tough bird. And he had many very um, uh, definite uh, ideas about this and he would not be swayed or moved by anybody. The legislature of New York State, well, he wouldn't listen to them. They said what he was doing was too, too big a project, too expensive, 
too much. Uh, parking lots were too big. Uh, the roadways leading to it were too big, and uh, it wasn't worth spending all the money on that. Uh, well, I'm talking to you while I'm drawing this, and so possibly it would be a... Uh, uh, this is too high, actually. I'm go I've, I've exaggerated the size of it. I'm going to pull this base up a little bit further because um, the proportion is the important thing. Even though you might be... Uh, I am overwhelmed with the size of it, this, is, this proportion is, is somewhat too, too tall. So I think the base is going to have to go here. And, uh, and this, is how, this is why you start out with a drawing. You don't start painting, as many other shows do, that you can start slapping paint on canvas. And that's, um, that's a very poor idea, because proportion is the important thing about these, about these paintings. You must be, pay attention to whether or not, because you don't recognize it. If it's out of proportion, it is not the thing itself. Um, the uh, the, uh, the uh, inspiration for this particular design is Venice. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moses went to Venice and was uh, taken in, of course, as everybody is, whoever goes there, with the incredible uh, architectural beauty of the place. And he uh, used uh, the Campanile of uh, St. Mark's uh, place as his, um, as his uh, motif for this particular subject. And you can see that uh, if you sort of uh, try to fill in many, many little um, salmon-colored buildings on either side, if your imagination would be able to build up on either side of this particular tower uh, all of the little uh, village buildings that you find in Europe and in Italy, uh, you, might be, you might be able to really understand that this is very similar to, the, uh, to what you see in Italy. Um, and anybody who goes there comes away with the uh, overwhelming understanding that uh, Europe were masters of, the, of architecture in many, in, in, in many cases uh, and has survived for lo, these maybe thousands of years. Uh, Greece, of course, is, is, is one of them. But anyway, here we are. Let's, let's let get uh, kind of tight in here because I'm going to show you about the um, business of, uh, of perspective. This is, a, this is a good lesson in perspective. Here is the base of what you see. This is where the cars run. Let's put a little car in here if you don't understand. This is where the cars go. And there is a road, obviously, there. That's a terrible looking car. There, it's a station wagon. There we go. Uh, anyway, this is just to give you some idea. I'm not going to paint that. I'm just going to show you that that is where a road is because you can't see it from here. And here is a here is a step arrangement. Uh, so this is the lower part of that uh, of the of the scene that you're seeing. And then comes the lesson in perspective. I've talked about angles for many years, and here is the opportunity to show you about angles. The angles lead the eye right into the picture. So here's one, one, good, one good one. That tells you immediately that the eye is going to go that way. And then, because things recede to a smaller size as they go away from you, these bushes uh, are going to experience the same, the same uh, perspective uh, interest here, going in this direction, because that's the vanishing point. And here's the top of the bushes. The top of the bushes is as important as the sides. Uh, they occupy a, <clears throat> an elongated rectangle. And then on this, uh, this obviously is going to go away, and I hope that's not confusing anybody. If it is, I shall wash it out with some turpentine and some, and some paper toweling. And here are the trees. They also conform to a certain uh, di diagonal. The diagonal meaning that these trees are getting smaller as they go away from you. So there is, a, there is the, um, the uh, follow-up of the diagonals being the perspective drawing. So we go on to the other side. The same uh, condition occurs over here. The, uh, the angle leads the eye here. You immediately have a, an alleyway leading to this main motif. This, uh, this, this is the point of the picture of the, uh, of the tower. You, you lead the eye into it. And um, here's the, here's the uh, line that vanishes to this point here, and the top of it probably like so. And then over here, a slight suggestion of little tiny trees. And if the trees weren't there, uh, as a, a proportion reference, you would not know really how tall this building is. The, the building, of course, I have in notes here because I don't commit these things to memory. The, the, to the tower is actually 200 and, let me see, how many feet is that? I mean, let me just check this out. 231 feet tall. That's not bad for a place of Long Island, which is so flat. However, one of the interesting things about this is going to be the background for this tower. Background is a lovely Long Island, typical cloud, uh, cloud uh, spotted sky of early, early spring. 
And uh, I've often su suggested that uh, skies be uh, paid attention to a great deal more than they are in some of these uh, programs that are not mine, whereby a four inch wide brush takes place and you just smear a lot of blue on the canvas and you sort of make it blend to less blue. No. I'm going to, once again, uh, chide uh, that technique and tell you that it is not painterly. It also gives for a really an embarrassing amateurish look. And uh, uh, those paintings are found in yard sales for 50 cents uh, these days, which tells you that their artistic merit is uh, minimal uh, at best. Here I'm going to work on the canvas, as I have many times before, and it uh, works because you do not have to run around uh, carrying a uh, messy, cumbersome, and possibly even just too much material, too much equipment. You can mix it on the canvas. You can see that it works very well. What I'm doing is mixing the quick-drying MG, quick-drying white, from uh, the Grumbacher people, and uh, some flake white, which is not the quick drying, but it's going to give me a somewhat similar uh, uh, texture, but it also is going to take only slightly longer to dry than the quick drying white. Uh, also, cerulean blue, uh, the letters that I get, and I have a whole bunch of them over here, tell me that I don't explain enough about the color mixing. Cerulean blue and a touch of ultramarine is what makes this particular color. Well. As, we, as I've said before, the palette knife does wonderful things as far as speed is concerned. It, uh, it allows you to cover a large area in a very short space of time, not because I am trying to become the world's fastest painter, but because if you paint from life out there in the wild, you are dealing with time problems, namely the day leaving you and the sun changing and the whole, uh, whole general lighting effect of that scene changes. Uh, Every, uh, well, it changes all the time, obviously, but it changes very rapidly. And so if you can get uh, large spaces uh, painted uh, quickly, then you'll be able to spend more time doing the details. However, the reason for doing the uh, sky first is that it's the background. And anybody who's watched this for a long time knows that you work from the furthest distance away towards the foreground. Here is the manner in which I do it. Uh, I find that covering an entire canvas with uh, color uh, without the drawing beforehand uh, is a dangerous, uh, not dangerous, it's just not, uh, it's just not particularly professional, nor is it effective. It doesn't really work very well. So I've gotten the, the darker blue down to this level, and I'm going to now put some more, uh, I'm going to dilute it and make it paler because I'm trying to work down towards a blend of lesser color as you get towards the land. Uh, the atmosphere on Long Island is very uh, specific. It's different than it is in Greece, or let's say even in the, uh, the southern part of the United States. Long Island has a particular atmosphere, very much all its own. Uh, the, the, maybe you can't tell the subtle difference between these two colors, but um, I will. And yeah, yeah, you can see it somewhat. There is, a, there is certainly a change in tone. And if anybody is really w watching this carefully and wants to uh, have a, uh, a nice smooth blend, that blend is done uh, after these two colors have been put next to one another, and then you can fuzz the edges. Um, the letters that I get say that I'm quite clear on a lot of things, and sometimes I don't make as clear as I might the mixing of the tones, and I agree with that. But I, I, what I'm afraid of, of is to lose your interest. and. Um, so I keep moving quickly and try to play the whiz kid here with the, with the colors, and maybe I'll spend a little bit more time uh, mentioning the use of, of the colors that I mix. I understand that that's a very complicated and maybe even frightening uh, experience when you get uh, a whole bunch of colors and you don't know which ones make what. Now I'm going to use some plain cerulean blue on here without any ultramarine in it because the tone becomes much paler as it gets to the horizon, and it also has a slight green quality to it. Don't take the word green for what it means. It is actually blue, but uh, there's enough yellow in it to make it appear to be uh, bluish green on the horizon. The lower, the lower values of the sky are definitely uh, uh, characteristic of Long Island's area. Uh, all of this has been um, all of this has been talked about many times before, and apparently the message is getting through because my letters uh, uh, say that I am in fact helpful. Um, if I wasn't, it would be um, it would be a sort of a waste of time on everybody's part. 
the uh, the blending is, is what is intriguing to me as a realist painter, and there uh, there is something going for realism. Uh, realism seems to be uh, very much appreciated by people who are either learning to paint or people who simply buy paintings. They seem to like to know what they're looking at. And um, recognition of a place is as important as recognition of a, of a person in a portrait. Uh, so, and that's the fault that I find a great deal of the time with uh, some of the other programs that the places are uh, somewhere in the imagination or in the mind's eye or made up from the, uh, uh, from the demonstrating uh, painters. They, um, they kind of just sort of settle for maybe just about any old thing. Um, here is the blending process with a nice clean brush that has not yet uh, been uh, really battered by your tr yours truly, and I really am murderous on a brush, but that's because I paint so much and they require and I require a great deal of service from these brushes. However, this one still has its price tag on it. And I'm going to try to keep it uh, from deteriorating too quickly because it costs $9.65. Well, people are going to say that's a lot of money for a small brush, but it's going to do the job. And if you don't have the right brush, it isn't going to do the job, which is pretty much the story about all materials. If you get the good stuff, it works. Like Mr. Moses used the best stuff, the most expensive, and it's still here. So I'm going to take a break for just a moment and we can carry on with our little travel log. So, so I'll be right back. After a very short break and uh, only a slight bit of uh, blending as uh, as the break took place uh, because I'm I, I intend that you see every move I make uh, because there are no tricks here this is all very purposeful uh, activity uh, no no desire to make it look uh, good by accident it has to look well or it has to do what it does on purpose and uh, the uh, the concentration that I have is that uh, the strokes make it painterly. It also tells you that there has been a, d a definite reason for these strokes uh, and not to rely upon a tremendous amount of accidental blending, as it were. Um, the, uh, this tower, which is enjoyed by literally millions and millions of people, has been uh, in existence since, um, since 1929. Uh, a very long time, over 60 years. The thing is over a half a century old, and it has uh, it has many, many purposes. Not only is it a landmark, but in it, because it's called a water tower, there are 315,000 gallons of water. It, that's what it holds. And of course, it dispenses it uh, to the water fountains, the, uh, the uh, restroom facilities, and probably to the uh, watering of the flowers, whatever there are there, and to the general need of the public for water. And this tower uh, is the purpose for that. 
It's a it's a it's a rather remarkable thing uh, based on the on that uh, uh, the company of St Mark's uh, Cathedral uh, Chapel uh, Church in Saint in Venice. Um, it has uh, it has been uh, it has been uh, the uh, it was the bane of the existence of the people who were in power back then and who were doing these things and 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 it's, it was built around 1929, which means that it may have started in 1927 and taken two or three years to build. If anybody knows uh, anything about this park, uh, about the length of time that it took to do, there are many people who are still around that uh, were in on that. I'm going to wait now for a while for this to dry somewhat so that the color sets a little bit and the clouds will be put on probably in part two of this program because part one and part two are the way we, we divide these things and um, and it needs a little bit of time between because I've used the other paint. Uh, I'm not going to put the clouds in while I uh, take the chance of picking up the color uh, the, the, an overlay painting is what oil painting is all about. You overlay the colors. So the clouds will go on a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, work on this uh, foreground here somewhat. It's something that I don't normally do, but we'll get a feeling. Maybe I'll just put some, some work on this uh, on the tower. The tower is an interesting color. It's made of something that they call barbazon brick. Now, I really can't tell you what barbazon brick is, but it has a quite a, quite a lovely uh, color scheme to it. Uh, being pinkish in tone with some granite, and um, uh, it, it was the mo oh too dark, uh, so uh, some white is added to this, and maybe a, a toning of uh, some yellow green to tone down the pinkish quality of the color that I've used, which I I have pulled this out of the uh, tube that is called. Um, uh, flesh tone, which is a dumb term for, I mean, flesh tone certainly is, uh, in this world, flesh tone is not one single color. I would prefer to call it uh, all around rose tone uh, because it's an essential color for the painting, for just about any painting. There are rose tones in just about everything. And here I'm, I'm, I'm applying the base color of this tower uh, with, the, with the color that I've told you about. And because it's a head-on view, the um, the uh, painting of it is quite simple. We don't have to worry about uh, shadows of the shadowy side of it. This is a uh, a facade view of this tower. Um, it is uh, it was uh, the complaint, of course, when this was put up in 1929, uh, which was the year of the American crash. From what I I was not here at that time. I was in Europe, but it certainly was a uh, was a known subject matter in our house uh, about the uh, America was experiencing a financial disaster, uh, but this was Mr. Moses was uh, out here on this dune or this sand spit at, at the Atlantic Ocean, throwing his weight around and building this uh, this genuine landmark, which is what it has. It has been it has been uh, you know worldwide known for uh, ever since that time. Um, he used the, the expensive materials. It is the the part that is not pink, which is the barbers and brick. It's uh, it's Ohio limestone, and of course. There are some people with more vision than others, and the people who were there did not see the vision of this, uh, thought that the, all they were looking at was the bottom line of the cost, and he was looking at something else, namely the, uh, the durability of this. So uh, all in these public, uh, these, these public projects, there are always these interesting sidelines. Uh, so with all this chatter about Mr. Um, Moses. You wonder, how come it's not called Moses' uh, water tower? Uh, why is it called Jones Beach? And it is called Jones Beach because a man called Jones bought this land way back in the 1700s and uh, built a whaling station here. And while I'm talking to you and while you're seeing all this going on and I'm jabbering away at you, I'm going to run the line of the only shadowy part of this. It goes down the line. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat of a delicate matter. You can see I'm holding my arm up and running a darker line down this side. Obviously, there is a, there is a jutting out part of this building and it is, it is in shadow. And it needed to be there. And uh, in, in order to do that, you actually should stop talking but I never stop talking. So I'm, I've put this shadow line in here while I'm telling you about Mr. Jones. His, the name stuck. He built a way, he, he was actually a privateer. And he, uh, privateer means that he was a bloody pirate. And he would, uh, he would abscond with whatever he found on boats that he stopped on the high seas. And as a result of that, very much like Mr. Boski, I suppose he made a fortune. 
and making a fortune, he was able to buy all of this land, how thousands of acres out here, and build his whaling station. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is that this man, who obviously was something of a of a crook, <laughs> got his name forever ind indelibly printed in history by uh, this beach. Uh, and uh, stranger things have taken place, of course. There are some more shadow lines because of this tower. The tower has got some detail to it. It's not just a, it's just not a great big uh, brick um, uh, square thing sticking up. It's got some detail to it, and rather handsome at that, as a matter of fact. And I have to put that in because recognizability of these pictures is vital. I need a little bit more turpentine, a little bit darker color that I'm going to mix right here. There, there, this is, uh, this is uh, some... Uh, alizarin crimson and a touch of the uh, of uh, some umber to make that shadow color uh, and a touch of my quick drying marge medium which I have mentioned a few times before and here is this perfectly awful palette which everybody says is wonderful looking up um, I'm going to run these lines as I talk to you more about mr. Jones uh, whose uh, whose name uh, is uh, is uh, associated with this uh, national park and isn't it interesting that a, uh, a pirate, a privateer, somebody who bent the rules and probably broke the rules many times and was in fact probably a thief, um, has got this lovely place that everybody enjoys uh, named after him. I think that it's, uh, I think it's an interesting point in history. These people, of course, are forgiven by time and the fact that they've gone and died. Uh, the, there's the living ones that, are, um, that we uh, have so much trouble with. Uh, however, all of this human behavior has been in existence, lo, these uh, way over 200 years ago. And here we have this, uh, this piece, uh, this piece of American history uh, that brought to you by the Cable Easel Travelogue in person, as it were. And, oh, boy, I've gotten that signal from this uh, shadowy figure in the, dis in the studio here that holds up two fingers like this, and that says two minutes left, which means that um, I'll do as much as I can between now and the time I have to close, and then the next half hour, which will be the next program that you will watch, hopefully it will follow this one short, uh, the next day, and you won't have to wait in between, um, for this part two of this uh, water tower of Jones Beach. Here is that, uh, here's that window, which obviously is uh, needed for either uh, measuring the water level inside or for observation of uh, disasters pending on the weather. I don't know what these little windows are for, and I'm hoping that somebody is interested enough in this to call me up, or to, not to call me, but to write to me and tell me some of the details which I haven't gotten, uh, which I probably do have and I have not read. Here is the, um, I'm going to wind it up by giving you the point on the top of this, uh, of this uh, building, which is going to be done with the color that I have told you to never use under penalty of death and maiming called thalo green but the top of that tower has got that kind of color on it and uh, the thalo green is going to be used now with a touch of yellow to really get rid of the acid quality of that thalo green but that's the color that is um that is at the top of this tower and let's see if it works uh, it's wonderful. It looks like it's probably um, uh, copper that has turned green. Uh, and yeah, I'll probably refine this a little bit and um, give the shine to it. But this is the, um, this is, oh, it goes down in between here. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, it goes down in there. And uh, while, uh, while uh, um, I am waiting to do the uh, other uh, half hour of this program, I'll probably do some detail of that uh, particular, uh, it's got some dark side to it, too as most things usually do. There is a shadowy side to this. And as I wind up the program, I'll just put the little dark shadowy side on here. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching this one. I'm glad that uh, you caught me here doing this wonderful tower. Uh, the next program will be the winding up. Uh, once again, Pat Windrow at the Cable Easel saying bye-bye. See you again.